Everyone, we're going to go ahead and kick this off. Thank you for joining us this afternoon or morning for those of you out on the West Coast. My name is Sarah Vogt. I manage the East Coast here at SOFOS for the MSP team. Um, on the line with us today, super excited to, to dive into these topics. We had a ton of feedback after the first initial session a couple weeks ago and people just really wanting to learn more about um, cyber insurance. And so we have partnered with Jason, who is the CEO of InTouch Insurance Services. He is going to be tag teaming the majority of this presentation with Nicholas, who those of you who are on the call previously had the opportunity to hear from. He is our senior director and global risk partnership. Um, is, is, or his responsibilities here at SOFOS. And then Greg Rosenberg is the director at, of sales engineering. He'll be here for the more technical questions, but um, super excited to have them both. And without further ado, I'll turn things over. My ask is for questions. Please, instead of using the chat, use the Q&A. It'll help us keep track of um, and make sure that we take care of everybody's questions as we go. We want this to be interactive. We wanna make sure you get the most out of this that you possibly can. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate uh, you taking a little bit of time out of your day to visit with us. Uh, Jason, Greg, and I are excited to, uh, to kick this off and uh, looking forward to uh, a good discussion. As Sarah indicated last time around, there were lots of questions. Hoping for that this time, we've got a great resource in Jason. Uh, and so let's go ahead and uh, dive in. Jason, you there? I am right here. All Thank right, you, everyone. Thank you. Trying All to right. get my video on. Um, right. Eventually, it will come on. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Um, but thank you for having me, uh, Greg, Sarah, and Nick. I uh, look forward to uh, collaborating with you on this uh, presentation and a crash course on cyber insurance. Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it off here. Uh, can everybody see the slides OK? I want to make sure my camera is not viewing it. I see Greg shaking his head, all right, perfect. So uh, this slide's a little bit of a callback from our discussion last time, but I think it's an important starting point. Uh, and this is why I have cyber insurance in the first place. And so uh, really kind of the key areas that, that you, know, you could roll this up to, there's the financial benefit of a cyber insurance policy, there's the operational benefit. And then of course it provides peace of mind, uh, you know, the financial side that's in the risk transfer, right? You are sending risk over to the insurance company uh, in the event of that claim, right? And, and, and so the point there is quite self-evident. On the operational side, a lot of people don't realize, but there's, there's experts, uh, you know, like Jason, like Greg, uh, that can get involved in the claim when you do need to have it, uh, the service. And, uh, and those experts will help you achieve the operational efficiencies whether it's outsourced legal counsel or you know, a notification vendor to send out letters, an IR company to help do the investigation. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, having those experts, having that risk transfer all ties back to the peace of mind. And so that being said, hope to give you a little peace of mind here in terms of how the cyber policy functions, what are some of the basic mechanics. And so uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's, let's get into that there. So, What's covered under a cyber policy? Well, you can break this down into kind of like three categories, right? So you have the, the type of liability, uh, which means, you know, in, in the context of a claim, where did that claim st stem from, right? So you have network security and privacy that are kind of lumped together. So this would include, you know, ransomware and that type of thing, malware, uh, network breaches, that sort of thing. You've got media, intellectual property and content. These are a little bit kind of specialty that's less uh, you know, they can, they can be connected. And Jason, I'll let you kind of talk about how they, they connect. Sure. But then also the liability with your own products and services that you may be purchasing some, like, like from a Sophos or like a professional services, right? So these are all kind of the, the key areas of the, of the actual liability for, in terms of where the claim can start. Do you often see, uh, you know, how, how do you see the media and intellectual property content kind of kick in relative to cyber, Jason? Uh, Nick, I... I see a kick in when, and I'll, I'll back up just a second. Um, yeah. There's so many different cyber liability policies that people are running around with. Um, been in the business uh, 20, almost 23 years. Um, in touch has been around. Uh, we co I co-founded it with my partner in 2010 and we get, 
we, we get and we see so many different type of policies. To the answer your question on the media and the intellectual property, uh, it depends what exactly the insured or the client needs. Um, some cyber policies don't have a cyber crime component of it. You talked about ransomware, uh, social engineering, extortion, those are crimes. Um, so certain policies might have it, certain policies don't have it, and we will dive into what the different type of policies are, but media um, is a huge component if they're disseminating anything on the internet or anything in the media or any type of medium. So you really, you know, you really got to look at what the needs are, what the exposures are of the insured, and then reverse engineer it to get a policy that was specifically tailored to their concerns and their exposure. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And, and, and so, so, so in, in our orange area here, we have the privacy liability enhancement. Right. We've got the first party coverage. Would you say that in, in terms of the first party coverage available, you know, uh, revenue loss, business interruption, data reconstruction recovery, the crisis management, extortion, are, are those kind of the, the basics? And then, you know, you've got the enhancements over here based on, again, what you would advise a, a specific company to deal with or... Right. Would you say these are kind of more found commonly as a, as a baseline these days? I mean, they're more of a boilerplate. Um, you're looking at, uh, you know, first parties. So it's, you know, it's your own revenue loss, um, you know, crisis management. These are, um, I would say, things that affect you as a company, as a business owner. Um, third party would be non company. So that would be, uh, Nick, if you were to um, go ahead and, and breach uh, company X, Y, and Z, that would be more of a third party. Or if you're storing information of your client, if you're an MSP or, uh, you know, or you're an IT, you're storing information for your clients, then that's even a double exposure because that's a first party and a third party. So third party is non-company. Sure. Um, so, you know, really there's so many different ways you can go about getting a cyber policy and what's covered in them. Um, you know, like I said earlier, um, a lot of people are running around with something, but they just don't know what it is. <laughs> sure. So from that standpoint, you're trying to figure out, okay, what's their exposure? If they're an MSP, are they taking and storing information of their client? Um, because then your risk or exposure goes up even higher, if, even if they get breached then your information that they're storing for you is compromised. Sure, sure, sure. Well, let, let's let's get into that. So let, let's get sure. into some of the costs uh, of a policy. So, you know, the components that, that, that make that cost up. Um, so we've all heard that, you know, the cost of cyber insurance is increasing. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. But I want to talk about just kind of the basic mechanics for a second in terms of what goes into the cost of a policy. And so generally when I'm, when I'm talking, I, I break it down really broadly, right? You've got the demographics, you know, what industry is the company in? You know, how are they doing business? How long have they been in business? How big are they? How many employees, revenue, all, all, all of the demographics, right? The basic stuff. Then you've got kind of what you're talking about, that potential exposure. So trying to quantify what that is. Hey, if a, if a threat actor makes his, way, uh, his or her way into the network, uh, you know, and, and you lose everything, right? What, what does that total universe of exposure look like? Uh, what does the existing control look like? The level of cybersecurity, this one right here, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what your experience is, Jason, you can share with us here, but uh, in our experience, this is, this is absolutely the area where the carriers right now, I, I feel like are really starting to focus more and more is examining what that existing level of cybersecurity is. You know, they're, they're, they're starting to become trained and familiar with, you know, EDR versus MDR, uh, mm -hmm. you know, ER versus XDR, uh, you know, uh, multi-factor, uh, zero network trust, you know, all, all of these things that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we orbit around on a day-to-day, -day, now seems like the carriers for the first time really are taking this sort of stuff seriously with respect to that cybersecurity. W what, what are you seeing in your experience there? I see everything you're saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, to, to, to drill down on it, the applications the insurance carriers have are still antiquated for the for the exposure what they're underwriting. For example, the you might have an application from one carrier and it's it's somewhat remedial, and then what happens is they 
they meeting the broker, myself, we give it to the uh, underwriters and it gets regurgitated out with about 25 to 30 questions. Um, most of those questions are, what level of cybersecurity do you have? Do you have MF MFA? <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have 321 backups? Do you have encryption? What kind of encryption? What kind of company are you? Are you MSP? Are you IT? Or are you a flower shop? You will not get a policy or a quote if you do not have MFA today. That's yeah, that's, that's basic rule number one. You, you, and I fight and I fight and I fight with our insureds to get it, to have them understand and educate them. Look, um, you know, you might not store information, you might not have a lot of PII, but if you don't have MFA, not only from third party from your vendors or your current uh, your current employees on the first party side, you're not going to get coverage, and that's going to be on the cyber and that's going to be on technology errors and emission. On the slide previously, we talked about technology services, so that would be like your malpractice for your software or any type of technology or uh, you know anything that you render for a service. That would be the errors and emission portion of it, and the cyber would complement it. So if you don't have MFA, there, you know, you're not going to be able to collect uh, two hundred dollars in Pasco. Um, gotcha. That's gotcha. just where it's at. Um, and then you talked about the exposure. One of the things that we do as in touch is that our bread and butter is small to medium sized businesses that don't have a lot of best practices in place because they don't have the you know enough employees or they you know they don't think it's going to happen to them. One of the things is we have to go ahead and risk assess them, whether it's a NIST or a partner with someone like you folks to do a risk assessment so they understand what the exposure is. And then you're able to build a policy based on those exposures and use it as underwriting um, you know, criteria to get them you know, not only um, a really good coverage, but you know, to get them a really good price. Because if they don't have those policies and procedures in place or best practices, they're going to be, be they're going to get the end of the line number one and getting a good quote and number two they might not have um you know a robust policy that will go ahead and, and insure them gotcha gotcha yeah that makes sense and and look i think this is a a good chance to for for the crowd here you know we just added a cyber and uh, cyber insurance section to the website the main uh www.sofos.com uh and so we will be posting a, a guide there very shortly that talks about some of these common things that the carriers are looking for and how that translates back to, to, to features or function uh, that's in the, the myriad Sophos products and services. Uh, so that'll be a great resource, should be going live here pretty soon to so keep an eye out uh, for that. So let's, let, let's you know, I, I wanna take just a quick sec here, right? To kind of talk through, you know, how it's getting harder, right? Hey guys. I, yes. <clears throat> Sorry, really quick, we have a question. Are there any MFAs or SSOs that we would recommend? Well, yeah, I mean, so <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's, a, well, here's what I'll say with that, right? So there are, you know, MS, MFA is a, is a, is a feature inside of some tech, right? Uh, its ability to work with single sign-on is a feature as well, right? And so there's going to be uh, Sophos products, uh, if you're using them, that are going to be compatible, right? So I'll say that, and, and, and again, you know, this guide will be coming live on the cyber insurance section of our, of our website very soon. Um, you know, as far as an MFA provider, as far as a single sign-on provider, I mean, of course, there's the big ones out there that I could that I could reference, you know, like an Okta or something like that. You know, but I, at the end of the day, where, where the rubber meets the road, Jason, you're the one that sees the policies. I mean, what what are some common ones that you see that you know, like, hey, if a, if a carrier gets that, uh, you know, they're not going to be questions. And Greg, I'll, I'll you know, have something. Yeah. To Chime in too. Really, you know. really quickly, and then I'll let Greg go. They don't go deep as far as which MFAs they're using. Really, it's basically on on the question, on the application, and then you might have to write some, you know, when the underwriter comes back to you with 30 questions, um, you know, you're going on a Word document, and you're saying, okay, we have MFA, um, and, you know, and we have it across the board. Sometimes the carriers will go back and ask which ones, but not often. Um, they just want to know if you have it and what the exposure is and how long you had it in there. 
they like the three, two, one backup question, um, um, you know, as far as where the backups are on the cloud. And then the other one is uh, encryption. Um, but as far as MFAs, Greg, go ahead and uh, you can chime in which ones that you like the best. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm on one side, so you're on the other side. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think there is something lost in the question. And that is, I don't care, is the, my short answer. The longer version, however, is implement it properly. It's just kind of like asking, do you have endpoint protection deployed? That's not the challenge that we see with most organizations that get hit. It's that they haven't installed an agent on every single device. Same thing with MFA and SSO. You know, you can't just buy a product that will then check a box and solve the problem or address the risk they're asking about. It's, do you have someone that can properly implement MFA or hopefully SSO across every single asset in the policy holders organization. That's what, what I focus in on. And I anticipate we will see those types of questions as we move forward as well. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, and it changes every couple months um, on the underwriting side. Gotcha. Well, for now, it sounds like though, it's a, it, it's a check in the box. They're not, going super through to, to look at the level of how it's been implemented or to look at who you're licensing it from, you know, it, it's a yes or a no. And then, you know, as the owner of that in the company, you know, your, your, your confidence rating should be based on how well that's implemented. Correct. All right. Correct. So, so let's spend just a, a minute here on, on getting cyber insurance, right? So, Globally speaking, you know, we're seeing carriers drop their capacity, right? So they're, they're, they're funding less of these policies. We're seeing premiums go up, you know, you know, 1, 1.5x, 2x uh, year over year. We're seeing ransomware continuing to cause problems. So, you know, people used to ask, hey, how, what's the best way to get discounts, you know, when it's harder to get cyber insurance? And I, I, I've been saying, hey, it's really about getting the right policy at the right price in today's market, right? It's, it's less about looking for discounts. You know, what, what do you see in, the, in this, this hard market that we're in, Jason? You know, what do you see by way of, is it possible to get a discount in this hard market or is it really just about trying to get, you know, the right risk transfer? Yeah, I mean, really it's broken down into, into several buckets. Um, I'll answer your first question. Um, it's harder but you have to know where to go and how to get it and what, what questions you need ahead of time um, to go ahead and get, I would say, the, you know, the, mo the best bang for your buck, for a lack of a better word. Um, standard carriers, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give uh, insurance 101. Standard carriers are like a Travelers or a Chubb or a Hartford or a CNA or Liberty, and then it goes on from there a lot of those carriers are pulling out of the market because they um, are having a hard time on the actuary side with the claims and the coverage standpoint to, you know, from the Lloyd's base, you have Lloyd's in London right there under the, um, on, on one of the areas there. Um, they're having a hard time competing because their policy forms are not as robust as the Lloyds and London products, number one. Number two, they've gotten a lot of claims. Um, we've had five or six different um, clients of ours that were with those standard carriers, and they've been non-renewed this year, and they've had no claims. Wow. Zero. They just, there's your 90-day non-renewal letter, and go to your broker to go out to open market. We have a couple of renewals in March that were with those standard markets that I talked about um, when not being specific. So from that standpoint, yes, it's harder. On the flip side of it, you've got to educate your clients. You've got to tell them, look, you're, you know, like I said, MFA, 321, backups, encryption, you need this to pass go. And then you need to know which carrier on the Lloyd syndicates is going to tailor exactly to your clients, um, you know, uh, sector, what vertical they're in. Um, if it's in a law firm, that's going to be one, you know, that's going to be one carrier. If it's going to be uh, an MSP, uh, that's going to be another one. So you have to have the knowledge of where and what type of, uh, you know, client is going to fit into what box and, and, and basically tell them this is what you need to move forward to get coverage. So, 
sure. I've got clients that do that and they're not paying any, you're not paying much higher than they were two years ago. Um, okay. And then I have some that have limits of five to 10 to 15, $20 million that, you know, they're technology companies and they have an exposure. So it really varies, but you really have to know the, the, the market and the product placement, which is key. Yep. Gotcha. <clears throat> So, you know, I was going to ask a question for Greg here, and then I saw that, uh, uh, you know, one of one of our uh, attendees had, had pointed to this as well. You know, for, for the folks that may not understand what 321 backup is, Greg, do you want to take that one? Uh, and, and then as a second kind of piece to that, uh, you know, we did have some feedback here that said, hey, 321 may no longer be sufficient. I think mm-hmm. I can understand what they're getting at there. But, uh, you know, let's maybe talk about that for a sec. So what is 321 and, and why may that no longer be uh, you know, on, on its face alone enough, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I want to back up before I even get to that. I'll address three, two, one backup. But I want to kind of talk about what we see in real life first when it comes to backups. Um, when it comes to backups, that's one of the things that most threat actors target before they deliver their ransomware in most of these cases. In other words, if you don't have something that you can recover from, then you are more likely to pay the ransom or have less leverage to pay the ransom. So the, when we talk about three, two, one backups, the three refers to three different copies of the data itself. So you've got your original copy and then at least two backups, right? So we've got replication is the first thing to think about. And two refers to the storage media itself. So it can be actually on drive, on tape, in cloud, you want it across multiple locations, hopefully that someone cannot get a hold of or that can't be tampered with in some way, shape or form. And the one is something that's offsite. So in practical terms, when we see an adversary, you know, a lot of times I I can't even tell you, and I'm not taking a dig at them, but we hear Veeam commonly talked about as a backup solution. In and of itself, it's fine. The challenge that we see in what 321 addresses is implementation. That's where we see the failure. So if you have no backups, we've got a problem here, right? Let's just kind of set table stakes here. However, we want to have backups going back as far back as possible on the critical systems, on different media, and as many locations as possible so that recovery of critical applications and data is possible as quickly as possible. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, so from, uh, you know, and then Jason, you know, on, on, on your side, you know, what, what, you know, three, two, one, is it really just the check in the box now? Is that, or, or, or do you find some carriers are they, going? To they play? check it for MSPs. It's check in the box. They might want to know, you know, what type of backups they have cloud, that type of thing. Um, but to Greg's point, it's evolving. Um, it changes every couple months as far as, you know, like we talk about the threat actors, what, you know, what the underwriting guidelines are. Today, they might want three, two, ones, but they might want something more robust in four months from now. Um, but again, the applications are still uh, antiquated based on the exposure. So if the underwriter wants to drill down into it, uh, Nick, they're, you know, they will. If not, and it checks the checks the box, and they move on, then they might not. So it really depends, you know, on who, what the exposure is, and what they're looking for. If they're looking for higher limits, then that might put a red flag, and they might have to go deeper, and they might ask why they need higher limits, and they might want to see a contract of a vendor of an engagement, which happens all the time. Gotcha. Okay. Hey, Thanks, hey, Nick. Um, yeah. Real quick, there was another question that came in, you know, someone kind of making the point that having backups for a longer period of time can also be a liability. The answer is yes, it can be. Um, And that's why organizations do risk assessments. We're not saying, you know, this is a question of what carriers may ask for, number one. So there's the compliance exercise of getting approved. And then there can potentially be a separate risk and security discussion, which may not map to those requirements for you to get a policy, right? Sometimes security moves a lot faster than compliance is the best way to think about it. The only reason we say that we would like you to have something that's longer living than two weeks is that adversaries also target backups where they try to infect them. So you have to kind of 
make a decision internally as to what is the appropriate length of time for you as an organization. What are you comfortable living with? Such that if someone were to not be able to tamper something four months, or excuse me, four weeks or eight weeks old, will that work for you in a, in a ransomware situation? Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, great, great, great point. And thanks for uh, thanks for clarifying that. So uh, I, I want to make sure because we've got lots of other great content uh, here. You know, we're about halfway through. Uh, so so let's go ahead and you know let's transition away from this for a moment. And I want to talk uh, about one of the most common, I think, issues that we run into. One of the most common kind of talking points around cyber, and that is this notion of you know where coverage may exist where does it converge where does it overlap you know this this happens often right where we'll get a customer that uh, thinks they have cyber but you know it's not a cyber policy they may have a writer somewhere else right uh, or, or they may have you know so, some certain clause within eno that makes them feel like they can go get this so you know jason why don't i just you know very freshly you know what what can you say about you know what your advice is obviously talk to a broker but you know i mean what can you say uh for the folks out there that, that may have some of these other policies what's the best way to understand you the know the best way is to go to your broker and have them do an assessment based on what your exposure is number one and what kind of coverages that you have i will really hone into this on the commercial general liability policy it's cgl so everybody I hope knows what general liability is, third party bodily injury, property damage, slip and fall coverage for uh, businesses. That's the easiest layman's terms I can um, speak of. I would say 50% of people that we get introduced to have an endorsement, which is you know uh, an add on onto the general liability policy, policy for really bare bones coverage for cyber. And they think that they have cyber crime covers. They think they have regulatory. Uh, we covered um, on a couple of slides prior to that what really what a cyber policy covers. Um, and they're running around with these endorsements saying, OK, I'm covered. Um, you're really not covered for much. In today's world, um, those antiquated um, endorsements are not covered, are not covering you much at all. Um, and if it's Go yeah, let, let's yeah, let's let, let's take it. I, I think step by step here, because we you know we do have uh, uh, the slides. I think that can provide some some added context here. So let's just kind of break it down. You know, uh, uh, going going kind of item by item here. So uh, you know, for CGL, um, you know, you've got these different kind of coverages. Coverage A, coverage B. Is this standard terminology? I assume it's standard terminology. Um, you know, it's third party bodily injury and property damage. Um, what, where the exclusion comes into on the CGL is tangible property, like physical, like, um, or tangible versus intangible. So if it's intangible, that's going to be something that you can't like touch. So their policy language is basically anything that's intangible. So a breach is intangible. Um, because you're not touching it. So those are excluded. Now you can, you know, I always tell this to my clients, insurance policies are living, breathing organisms. You can always remove coverage and you can always add it. So a lot of these CGL policy holders are running around with endorsements that give them some sort of bare bones, uh, you know, cyber uh, breach coverage for a limited amount of, you know, limits or, or uh, a sublimit of a, a certain amount, a million, half a million, that type of thing. So that's where the bis misconception is versus, you know, is it covered under CGL? It's not unless you get an endorsement for cyber. So, so let me ask you real quick about those endorsements. So uh, do you find most of the time is the, is the endorsement one dimensional, uh, you know, meaning, it's it's maybe a single first party coverage. It's a single first party risk transfer. Yes. Or are those or do, do, do endorsements exist that are three dimensional that have first and third that have, you know, uh, um, uh, lost business and, all, you know, all the different kind of first and third party coverages. Does that exist in the, in the world of writers or is it just always, you know, one it's, and done? it's first party. I, you know, this is going to shock. Well, maybe it won't shock you. I um, we <laughs> got introduced to an MSP that's got five to $6 million of revenue um, and they store their clients, uh, some of their clients data. 
they're running around with a general liability policy from one of those standard carriers I mentioned earlier in this webinar, and they have an endorsement that covers them just for fifty thousand dollars, five zero, zero zero zero, just for a breach, and it's only first party. And I cringe. I you know I've been in this business a long time. I just cringe because I you know they're carrying data of their clients and they have no coverage and they just don't know. And I said, what did your broker say? Oh, they haven't called me back. Okay. So we're taking over that. And we're going to fix it because we need to remove them and get them out of a standard market. Like I talked about and get them a standalone technology errors and emission policy with cyber crime and cyber liability coverage, coverage with all the bells and whistles. So it's a process. Um, so the answer to your question is, yeah, a lot of people are running around with this and they think that they have coverage with these endorsements. Gotcha. And um, they do up to a certain point. <laughs> gotcha, That's gotcha. Okay. All right. So commercial general liability, you know, you shouldn't just lean on that. Uh, that would that would definitely be not with the problem. endorsements. though. if you don't have endorsement and you have a, uh, a CGL or a commercial general liability policy, then you need to call your broker now. Gotcha. All right. What about property? We were talking about property. What, you know, what if, what if the attacker breaks in and bricks, you know, $10,000 worth of machines? Yeah. Again, it's it, the property is going to go under the general liability in the insurance language. It's called a package policy where you package the general liability of property together. Again, they're not going to go very far with coverage unless they have that endorsement. Um, I do see on those standard carriers that I mentioned that sometimes they have twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars of a sublimit for um, business interruption if they have the endorsement on it. But again, and, and you know, another thing is property is business interruption, and unless you have a robust cyber liability with cyber crime coverage and you're a victim of it, and you and and you're a victim of it, the business interruption, which is the money the insurance company gives to you to keep your business going while while you have a claim and um, your business is shut down for whatever. So a fire to a building, um, a ransomware that shuts down and you can't move. These policies are not going to pay out the business interruption and the extra expense. That's the extra money the carrier gives to you to get, get a policyholder back on their feet. They're just not. And okay. um, I looked at one from a standard carrier uh, on Friday and um, they gave $15,000, $20,000 which is nothing in today's world. Sure, sure, sure. This is interruption. So property and general liability, they go hand in hand. Gotcha, okay. What about directors and officers? Directors and officers. So, you know, you can, a data breach may lead to an investigation or enforcement action by the SEC or Dow Jones. If you read this slide, it's, it's very, there's great. The DNO is not going to pick up a breach or a ransomware. However, if an individual board member and the board itself under a DNO policy is sued for not getting cyber insurance, there might be some coverage on that. And we had a claim last year in our office uh, on that. It's not going to pay the ransomware. It's not going to pay the regulatory fines if there is. And it's not a cyber policy, but you might be able to prove that the board or individual board members did not go ahead and act to get a cyber policy. And I always tell my clients, I said, the directors and officers policy is, is a very, very complex policy. And it's, it's basically the overlap between an errors and omission, which is malpractice and a general liability. So there are some coverages in there, not specifically for cyber, but you might be able to, if the board members are sued, directly by uh, an employee saying, you know, or a third party saying, hey, look, we thought you had cyber insurance. How come the board didn't get it? And if the suit was brought against them, the policy might pay to that because that's really, you know, breach of fiduciary duty. And that's what I'm seeing a lot. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, that makes sense. I know I'm trying to cram everything. <laughs> no, no, it, 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 it does. It does. And I, I mean, you know, that's, uh, you know, having, having spent the last 17 years in this space, I actually had had some experience with that as well, where um, right. you know, the board did end up getting sued because of, of some, uh, I, f I forget the legal term they were using, but it was, you know. Well, it's, it's really the breach of, fiduciary, breach of fiduciary duty. Yes. The DNO is not going to cover a cyber policy, but but if the board had sued 
is sued because they didn't get one, then the DNO will respond. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. If that uh, makes sense. It, it does. It does. Uh, what about a crime policy? So, you know, it, let's also talk about, because I think, you know, cyber crime is different from crime, but it's this, you know, it, it's, it's both crime. You know, when you say, is it covered under a crime policy? Uh, are we talking a cyber crime or are we talking a separate crime policy? I mean, how much should we care about the nuance between a cyber crime versus a crime? I guess is the question. There, there's overlap there. And again, um, endorsements, which are, I would say, living, breathing entities that add on coverage and subtract coverage from a regular policy. Um, endorsements help, for example, may cover um, the second one down, loss of money or securities resulting from fraudulent fund transfer. So we have a client really quickly, 30 seconds, that is a huge entertainment account, a uh, huge entertainment production company, and they did not get cyber insurance, but they got a crime policy. So we endorsed the loss of money or securities resulting from fraudulent fund transfer electronically which is basically social engineering. Um, they were trying to get a movie script for another movie and they wired $800,000 to a bad guy. Four times. <laughs> Not once, but twice, but three. So forget about the risk map because we, we've tried. It's, it's the wild, wild west in, in this, you know, in entertainment accounts. But they did not have a crime, excuse me, they didn't have a cyber policy, but they had a crime policy. And we endorsed these coverages on there, loss of monies or securities from fraudulent fund transferred electronically. The carrier covered it. Um, you know, loss resulting from employee dishonesty. So these are all really standard um, coverages with endorsements on the crime policy. But on the flip side of it, Nick, it's not going to give you um, intellectual property. It's not going to give you ransomware coverage. It's not going to give you extortion. Not gonna yeah, I'm not going to pay for lawyers and experts. Right. It's not going to pay for that. It's not going to pay any regulatory. So it's the pro and the con. If you're doing a lot of, if you're sending out money to everyone to get movie scripts and they're all fun, you know, wire transfers. Yeah. That's social engineering. So it's going to cover some, it's not going to cover the whole thing. So there is some overlap if that makes sense. It, it, it does. It does. You know, and th this was a big one, too, back in the early days of the identity theft policies uh, on, on consumers. The, the, you know, the difference between an electronic fund transfer and a credit card, for instance, you know, we're, we're, we're paramount, right? You know, you're talking existing cash based accounts versus credit card accounts, you know, so, so there's there's different coverages for those as well. I, I, I note here. And so, you know, to your point, this is a highly specialized thing. Nobody should be relying on it uh, alone for cyber. Correct. I think we have one more example here uh, of a, you know, does it cover potential coverage? Uh, right. and, and then we can kind of move on to down our next path. But uh, what about Eno? I mean, Eno feels like, uh, you know, of any of them, this one seems like it could, you know, next to next to just a general liability, seems like you yeah, I, I read it, about the you most. Know collaboration here i would say you know is it's all about professional services so they have a professional service they meaning the carriers have an exclusion and the first thing i do when i look at a policy i look at the exclusion which is the coverage they're taking away and the first one is um anything arising out of um you know the exclusion anything but professional services so professional services is what you're doing for a fee um so what i do if it's a technology company or um, any, any type of IT or MSP, I go and take the E&O policy and I link it with a cyber crime and cyber liability policy. And it's robust and they work hand in hand. If it's a law firm and they have a malpractice policy, it's gonna exclude everything that has to do with cyber. Now, I have seen some lawyers malpractice policy and uh, CPAs uh, uh, malpractice policies or E&O and they give maybe 15 to $50,000 of remedial, okay, here's your breach coverage and you get a $50,000 limit um, and it's remedial. Um, that's something that's an add-on onto their policy specimen form, but that's not a standalone policy and that's not really gonna cover much. And I do have clients that hone in on it. And I said, well, here's your cyber policy, quote, let me show you what it's covering versus your E&O um, malpractice policy. 
If you don't want to, if you can't see the difference and don't want to move forward with it, we need you to sign a letter that we offered you that. So if they do get breached, you know, that's our protection. But um, more often than not, they they get a standalone. But no, it's not covered under e &O. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks for that. So, so uh, you know, keeping it moving here, um, you know, and I just want to kind of hit on this quickly here. Uh, but let's, you know, starting to kind of talk about you know, the types of claims that you're getting these policies for, you know, can you, can you talk about, you know, as it relates to cyber, we've got some examples of these data privacy claims, you know, what, what, what would you say are other types of claims that are, are covered under those policies? Because I think if we look at these data privacy claims, most of these, you know, uh, I, I think somebody has probably at least read a news story about, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, is, is it, are the privacy claims really what's paramount for, you know, these, these cyber policies or, you know, I guess what, what else should they be thinking of in these policies? You know, the, these are pretty generic examples. Um, you know, uh, another one, a lot of it is spoofing, like a Chinese hacker spoofed their way into a law firm. Spoofing happens every second or every nanosecond. Everybody spoofs an email. They get in there, they think, oh, okay, Sally's sending me something, you click something, and the next thing you know, you uh, you got malware. So I would think I would say spoofing, um, you know, really identifying where emails are coming from because that's where the malware is is getting onto your server. Um, you know, you have a rogue employee, okay, that happens. But really, it's the example of, you know, the entertainment account, you know, they get wire, they're wiring money across the board, that's social engineering, and they're losing millions of dollars. Um, there's so many examples, Nick, of what, of, of what people are doing as far as trying to get low hanging fruit and compromising systems. But, um, you know, these are so many different, these are a couple examples, but there's so many different examples of privacy or data comprom uh, being compromised, as well as, uh, you know, really cyber crimes. Yeah, well, so, so should we look to ransomware specifically, right? Is, is ransomware now at this point, something that we need to look to in a policy by name? In other words, you know, do you find that ransomware as an exclusion from data privacy? Or, or is there specific coverage? You know, for, for instance, an extortion payment that would be, you know, coverage in addition to that would fall outside of what you get from a, a regular data privacy type coverage. Well, those are considered crimes. So, you know, that goes really back to a basic data privacy policy versus um, a basic cyber policy with data privacy in addition to cyber crime. So you gotcha. really got to look at the ransomware, the set and extortion, the social engineering, um, you know, uh, and then on the flip side of it, you have to look at the business interruption. Is it covering it? And then what the third party and first party coverages are on a policy. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. And it's overwhelming to a majority of people, which is why, you know, um, most of my niche or are, are my partners and I niche, and he's got an IT background, is into going ahead and assessing what our clients needs on the technology and the cyber side because you know before the pandemic we had four ransomwares afterwards we had probably 80 to 90 clients get compromised one way or another whether it was data privacy ransomware uh, wire transfer you know social engineering so every the low-hanging fruits out there and people just want to click buttons and they think you know, they're, they're not astute to going ahead and identifying where the bad actors are and where they're not. And yeah, I think I gotcha. that's, that's what it comes down to. But, you know, these policies are very, you know, they're evolving. So, um, but most people are running around with just basic data privacy breach coverage and, yep, not, gotcha. and not the crime. Well, so, so we, yeah, I've got the question here, Sarah. Okay. Is that what you were going to try? Yeah. Yep. 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 So Great. I think this is, uh, yeah, speaking of, you know, pressing buttons. Um, so, so we have a question here. It's, it's kind of a, a, a legal question, really. Uh, but for non compliant clients, are we protected by having them sign a document to acknowledge that they understand the risks of not taking our recommendations? So, you know, I think this is in the context of, of this gentleman you know, consulting with his clients about, hey, you know, best practices, you know, this is really kind of what you should be doing. And, 
you know, to get you to, to get them up to a level of compliance. Now, it doesn't state whether it's explicitly talking about a, a level of compliance or just general kind of best practices, you know, but what, what is your experience, uh, you know, in, in perhaps having some kind of attestation, you know, some, some liability of waiver of sorts, um, you know, yeah, so he's elaborating here, you know, they need training. So, so you know, what, what, what would you say, uh, you know, do you see people being able to create documents to, 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 you know, exempt them from these recommendations? I know that's kind of legally, anything kind of come to mind there? couple of things if we if we our, our our own malpractice carrier requires us to offer cyber liability insurance to every business owner so if they don't want it and this entertainment account that i was talking to you on the crime policy didn't get cyber we had them sign a letter that was drafted by our attorneys for our policy um uh, our, our policy uh, proposals, they signed off on it. So they had no recourse on the legal side um, to go ahead and sue us. Um, so we, we carry that letter and if our clients don't want it, we have them sign it and then we put it into our, uh, our management system. On, the, on their side, um, I've also go ahead and requested that if their clients are not, you know, Base, let's say it's a law firm and they're not going ahead and getting a cyber policy based on the advice of an attorney, then they should do the same thing. Gotcha. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I can play one, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but really from the standpoint of that, everybody's got a CYA. Um, and, and because once it, once a ransomware or a crime happens, it goes fast. And if it goes fast, they're looking for, you know, wh who do they call? And okay, I'm just going to blame my insurance broker because they didn't go ahead and offer. I'm going to um, blame my attorney because they didn't properly go ahead and explain to me that I needed this coverage. And it goes on from there. Um, so I would recommend everybody go to their attorneys and make sure that if you're if you are offering them are, are soliciting advice and saying, hey, look, you need to get coverage. And they're, you know, they're deaf to the ears. They don't want to talk about it. Then I would recommend them getting some sort of um, letter that they sign off on. Gotcha. And, and we've seen in practice the letters from a lot of our MSPs that are out there. The other approach that we've seen taken or both approaches is like an opt out. In other words, I'm going to drop you into XYZ security bundle with these solutions, whether it be, you know, MTR or XDR or a combination of that with MFA, where the, the customer explicitly has to say, I'm not going to do this. So not just saying, I don't understand it, but that they have to, you know, take action so that they don't have those security controls in place. Yep. And it's training. It's, it's best practices and training and training and training, Greg, your point. And it's, and even if you drill it into their head, they're not going to go ahead. And some people might not be open to it. Yep. All right. So um, got a few more minutes here. I want to kind of cover off, I think, on two more items. Then we kind of wrap it up. But, uh, you know, again, if you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A. We've got about 10 minutes left. So uh, if you have a question, please do uh, ask it now. Um, so, you know, this, this, this fact versus fiction no, this is, you know, this is one of your slides that you kind of speak to often. I mean, would you say that you, you know, is one of these your kind of most commonly, you know, perceived myths, you know, of all of these? Or, you know, I mean, what, what generally can you say about these? I mean, I don't feel like we have to walk people through each one exactly. No, I, I, I think the biggest one is our, our, our IT department tells us that we are 100% secure. Or our IT vendor says that they don't need, that we don't need the coverage that they got you secure. If your vendor or your IT department is telling you that, you need to get a new IT department. <laughs> just, <laughs> you, just, you just have to because they don't understand um, the, the exposure. They, you know, and it's an ego thing, you know. Um, I work with IT departments um, all the time. I work with IT vendors all the time. 
Um, so from that standpoint, that's the biggest misconception because they don't understand the risk management and they definitely don't understand insurance. So if you're trying to walk them through that, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, we need that. Oh, we need that to get a coverage. Yeah, you do. So that's the biggest one right there is that the IT department tells us that we're 100% secure. And it's funny because when I look at MSP, MSPs and IT um, vendors insurance policies, I cringe because they don't, they have a standard policy with an endorsement, like the one I just talked about last week. So that's the biggest one. Um, you know, everybody knows everybody that's had a breach. Um, you know, this is Robert Mueller. I always, you know, there's two types of companies. Those have been hacked and those that will be. That that's goes, that's probably seven, eight, nine years old um, when he said that, but I always use that as an antidote when I do presentations. But, you know, the other one, applications are too difficult to complete. Um, that's where we step in. And if you have a broker that doesn't work with you to help you um, navigate filling it out, then that might not be the right broker for you. Um, that's part of our risk management practice at InTouch is that we work with them to fill it out. And I did it Friday and Thursday with three different MSPs because they don't understand it and they don't understand what the underwriters are looking for. So that's an, those are the three antidotes that I look for at this little fact and fiction. Gotcha. Hey Jason, a, a question yeah. came up. I want to throw it over to you if I can. Sure. Um, there's a question about coming from an MSP, you know, how should they determine whether or not they should be holding the policy or one of the customers of the MSP should be holding it or if both should be holding a policy? Both should be holding, holding it. Um, the, if the MSP has got first and third party and it's got a robust cyber crime policy and cyber liability policy, it would have third party coverage. So they would have coverage for the data that they're storing for their client, but the client should also cover it, uh, get a policy as well. So I would go to both and, and the MSP, that would probably be more of an exposure. So it'll be a higher premium, but the client might not because they say, oh, our MSP is, uh, is holding our information or whatnot, but they need to talk to their broker. And if they don't have the answer, feel free to talk to me, but they both need it. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's, 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 uh, let's, let's bring this all home. Let's, uh, let's, let's bring this all home here. So, you know, I noticed you had this and we were kind of going through the deck earlier talking about ways to, to tie this all together. I, you know, I noticed you kind of put this here. I assume this is either a, a challenge out to, uh, to, to the audience or, you know, is this, is this the right time now to talk about, okay, so based on everything we've talked about, you know, how is a data breach covered? Do you get that data breach? You know, is, is there, is there, is there a checklist? Is this meant to be a reminder? You know, what, what is the party wisdom, you know, specific to, you know, this, how is a data breach covered? Um, it's covered in a, a couple facets. So every insurance company has a panelist of cybersecurity companies, um, breach coaches, which is the uh, law firm. Um, Usually the broker is, is basically facilitates it. And then once it's put the claim into the uh, claims department of the carrier, then they run with it. Um, you know, we, we go hand in hand and we work with cybersecurity companies. We work with law firms. So we're kind of the quarterback, but um, that's how it works. And there's an 800 number that the carrier gives out that, um, you know, to your broker and the brokers uh, gives it to the insured. It's on the policy where they call that number if there was a data breach. Yep. So, you know, the other thing too is remember this is a three-part series. So we are going to talk about the claims process, yep. Yep. Uh, you know, in, in, in detail. So, so that'll be, that'll be there. We're going to be doing that on sure. Tuesday, March 8th at, uh, at 10 PM, excuse me, 10 AM Pacific. Um, <laughs> next week, we're going to be doing, uh, you know, policy application and underwriting. Sure. We're going to get into the into the details on that. Uh, that'll be Tuesday, March first at ten a.m. Uh, CT. So you know, uh, we look forward to that. Uh, any other questions that you've seen, Sarah, Greg? Any parting wisdom here in the in the last few minutes that we have? So we have a um, a couple of other questions. We'll give people a chance to to add in as well. Um, can I just have cybersecurity insurance without any of the security controls? Very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm going to 
try to jump in. I, I think what people are trying to say is, can I completely, you know, transfer all my risk or can I completely, you know, accept all the risk? Um, no one completely understands their risk profile, right? This is kind of a, an act and, you know, we can get closer to understanding it, but there's a place for having both security controls and insurance. And there's going to be some overlap. I think people also have to accept that fact here as well. When it comes to the carriers, having spoken with them over the last year, they're kind of ramping up really quickly on security, right? They're, they, they were fortunate that I think they weren't having to deal with nearly as many claims before COVID. That world is over, right? I think we can all agree on that. And so they're trying to manage their risk a lot better by seeing does an organization follow best practice? How do we prove best practice? And to Jason's point, in a way that's not pain, as painful as possible during the application right. process. But by the same token, you can't just go in naked, I think is what we're essentially saying here is like you need controls in place. And the higher level of security maturity you have, the lower in general your premium is going to be and the higher the coverage limits and more coverage that will be available. So the answer is probably both. What the sweet spot is, is really the purview of, you know, a lot of the brokers that you can speak to. And I, and I will add, Greg, that earlier when we were talking about the standard carriers and the endorsements, you can get those remedial bottom of, you know, the barrel endorsements that give you some kind of limited coverage without having any practices in place. You're not going to have much coverage at all, but at least you have something. Um, I see another question that's come in about what level of MFA is required or expected. Is it only external VPN or other systems? The expectation is MFA for everything, mm -hmm. right? All applications, all systems, all users, doesn't matter if it's a server or an endpoint, it's MFA everywhere. What a lot of people don't realize, because, you know, Jason talked about the initial foothold or something that access brokers are really keen on. How do I get my foot in the door of you as an organization? Email is one mechanism. It's not the only mechanism. A lot of the big vulnerabilities that we saw last year for VPN clients, RDP, hey, look, we've got MSPs on. Uh, you're a big target uh, right now because of the tools that you use and the access that you have. So RMM tools, PSA tools, there's vulnerabilities in those that get exploited. You never know what the, the initial access du jour will be and how they're going to move within your organization or your customers once they get that access. So a long-winded way of saying you need MFA on everything. So um, another question we have is under what are some of the circumstances that a cyber claim might be denied? <sighs> Um, I'm not a claims person, but I'll play one right now. Um, not, not having, not having the right coverage. Um, if they have, a, you know, Nick had a slide just on the, uh, data privacy portion of a cyber policy. So let's say they didn't have the crime portion. It was a ransomware and they, it was excluded and they thought they had it. Be, they thought they had it under the policy. They put the, you know, they tender the claim and it gets denied because it's ransomware and ransomware is excluded. Um, if you're going with a very robust policy that covers the crime portion and the data privacy portion, um, most anything is going to be covered um, if it's falling under, uh, under those specific perils of the policy. So um, you've got to really look at the policy or talk to your broker to find out what you have, what you need, and then what you should be getting. Yeah, I would say in addition to that, so so crimes originating from within the organization. So I've seen some exclusions called out specifically if it was insider driven, mm -hmm. um, you know, meaning like, hey, if you had a, you know, a business partner that went rogue, right, or, you know, th th those are generally excluded. The other thing I've started to see some, you know, and, and I've heard mixed reactions to this in person when I'm at the cyber insurance conferences, and I'm having discussions with the underwriters you know, with the folks on the front line, you know, but, but we, we've seen some carriers, I've seen some carriers that are, are starting to write in or have tried to write in exclusions based on 
you know, protection existing on a device, uh, or, or in some cases, you know, a configuration, a specific type of protection existing on a device, meaning, you know, hey, we're not going to cover, you know, ransomware if, if, you know, patient zero was a device that was, you know, not within this network with this type of control with this type of setup, etc. Are, are you seeing any of that at all, Jason, uh, or, or not really? No, not not really. I think the insured versus the insured. Um, some policies have an exclusion if one, you know, uh, if let's say one partner is, you know, uh, stealing from another or you have a rogue employee that's doing that. Um, you know, that's where the first party comes in. So you have to look at the insuring agreements on that on the policy form. But other than that, I haven't, you know, we've had 80 to 90 in the last two years, uh, you know, one form or another of cyber or crime, um, social engineering claims, and all of them have been covered. So, okay. and it's been weird. So, so I haven't really got into that, but you need to talk to your broker. You need to look at the okay. policy and look at the insuring agreements. That's, that's good news. So what, one, one other quick question. So as, as cyber starts to get more programmatic in nature, uh, it, you know, and, and you may have little bits of coverage existing out there, from uh, you know programs that you may be enrolled in, right? Some VIP business benefit, uh, you know, some feature of a specific software that you bought, uh, you know, and you may have your own standalone cyber uh, policy. Can you speak briefly, you know, for those folks that may have multiple coverages, right? Fifty thousand over here, two hundred fifty thousand over there. You know, what what is what is the what is the best approach, or what can you say about you know, is that a good idea? Is it a good idea to stack and take as much coverage as you can find? Or, or do you really kind of want things tried and true, you know, one dimensional, one avenue? Some of these standard carriers put or give sub limits or extra goodies, as I call them, into these policies. Um, you know, maybe the general liability. Um, but from the standpoint of that, you really need to do a risk assessment and have your broker look at it. Um, you know, you people are running around. I always have this saying, people are doing something. You just don't know what it is until mm -hmm. you know what it is. Um, you know, and then you unpeel the onion and it's like, oh, okay. So we need to fix this. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of funky stuff. <laughs> yep. So, you know, best is just getting in there, rolling up your sleeves and, and fixing it and getting it to the point where, one policy does one thing, one does another, one does another, and then so forth and so on, instead of just moving it around and trying to, um, you know, put a Band-Aid on something. Gotcha. Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, it, it, but it also sounds like, you know, obviously more coverage is better than no coverage. Uh, 500,000 yeah, is going to be better than 100,000. 5 million is going to be better than 1 million. There's, there's yeah. no real exception to why that would, would prove to not be true. No, there isn't. But you, ha you have to make sure the coverage is right. And you have to make sure the, lim the limits are appropriate to what your exposure is and really what your revenue is. Um, you know, I got $30 million companies that are running around with $500,000 of uh, cyber coverage. Is there a general rule? Uh, is there a general rule on revenue to risk transfer? I would say... You know, my my rule has always been, OK, what's your gross revenue minus you know, your cost of doing business gives you X. And then from that standpoint, um, if you had to um, go ahead and pay out of pocket, that's what the amount's going to be. So you can reverse engineer it that way. There's a couple of formulas. I work with my clients on that. But if you're a three or four or five million dollar MSP of revenue and you're running around with half a million dollars of coverage or a million dollars of coverage, in today's world with inflation, <laughs> it's probably not a lot of money. Sure, sure. It's probably not a lot of money. And, um, you know, so it's just talking them through it and then going from there. There's not much premium difference. And I'll, I'll give this little tidbit out. There's not much premium difference between 1 million and 2 million on a standard cyber crime, cyber liability policy. So if 1 million is 5,000, a 2 million might be, I don't know, 20% higher which is probably worth it for half a million dollars. I mean, excuse me, a million dollars of more coverage. Um, where it starts getting expensive is the $5 million layer, the $10 million layer, the 15, because you're you're pulling in a lot of different uh, reinsurance companies for those limits on top of the original uh, amount. Yep, 
Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, all right, well, we're, we're almost 10 full minutes uh, after here. I guess the very last thing I'll, I'll, I'll just leave here since this is an MSP crowd, uh, you know, can MSPs get cyber in today's market? Yes. All right. There you they have can. it. You heard, you, you heard it from him first. They they okay. can. Um, they they have to understand the challenges and they have to understand what best practices and what levels of security they need to have internally. Um, and they need to have, you know, uh, a broker that that knows the business, knows cyber and technology and where to go to get it, because um, some of them are turning away MSPs and IT. So um, you have to know who the players are and you have to know what their underwriting requirements are. And then um, they have to understand where the world is as far as cyber insurance. Um, and then they have to, you know, basically put the best practices in place and and work work out the application with the broker. Yep. OK, come up with the plan and execute it. All right. Well, uh, I, I, uh, let's go ahead and end this. We're, we're, we're 10 minutes after now. Uh, Sarah, Greg, any 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 final uh, parting bits of wisdom here no just thanks for all the questions awesome group love it yep, yep. thank you all for coming Bye. don't forget we have the next session next week and um you'll need to register for that separately we will be providing the recording for those of you who've asked but thank you so much for your time everybody yep thanks jason thank you guys thanks, thanks greg sarah thank and nick everybody. Yeah, right. thanks everyone yeah, thank everyone bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.